in the book, one of the things I say is the atmosphere does not care what color political badge you wear. Mm. All it cares about is how much greenhouse gases are going in the atmosphere. So personally, I don't really care what politics you use or what policies you use, unless they're not really repressive, um, to actually change uh, industry and change the way we're doing stuff. Hi, Mark. Hi, James, and thank you for having me on your podcast. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's, a, it's an honour and a privilege to have you on. Um, as the second guest for, for the book club, I think um, those who have read the book, uh, all, all the feedback I've had so far for the book is, is brilliant. So for those who, who are listening to this or who are watching this, um, this is the book, How to Save Our Planet, The Facts, um, by Professor Mark uh, Maslin. Um, just to give you a quick intro to those um, perhaps who may have not read the book or perhaps haven't come across Mark before. Mark's a professor of Earth, uh, system science at uh, the University College London. Um, his area of scientific expertise is understanding the origins of the Anthropocene, the causes of past and future climate change, and the environmental challenges facing humanity in the 21st century. So very apt, um, uh, so very good to have, have Mark on. He's also published over 175 papers, so he's a, he's, um, he knows his stuff, uh, obviously published in, in serious uh, places like The Lancet, Nature. Um, and he was also a key advisor on David Attenborough's brilliant um, 2019 BBC One documentary, uh, Climate Change, The Facts, which I remember sharing a lot at the time. I thought it was a really good um, documentary that, that, that covered a lot of ground, but also just packaged it in a way that was very accessible. Um, so he's, um, he's definitely the right man to talk to if you're interested in uh, climate change related issues. So, Mark, thank you very much. Um, so I'll come straight in then. So question one I have, um, just, just to give the guys who perhaps aren't sure about some of the technicalities in, in the book at the beginning, I, I want to kind of go through chapter by chapter a little bit. Obviously, we won't go through yeah. the whole thing, but um, the Anthropocene, what is the Anthropocene? Because um, you talk about the sort of, you trace the kind of the versions of capitalism that we've seen throughout the Anthropocene, um, uh, the sort of mercantile industrial consumer. And then there's a kind of a comment, which I, I guess you get to the 1980s and you're talking about Thatcherism, the sort of neoliberalism of, of, of the Reagan, Re Reaganomics and stuff. Um, but just quickly, what's the Anthropocene? And then maybe I'll ask you a little bit about the kind of the, the neoliberal um, economics that, that, that we touched on in that chapter. Uh, so the interesting thing is that scientists are debating the Anthropocene. And the reason being is because we suddenly realized, and this was probably about 10, 15 years ago, that the impact of humans on the planet was so large that actually we could consider ourselves in a different geological period, yeah. a new epoch. And that was quite profound. So we are influencing the Earth as much as a meteorite impact or plate tectonics. And so we're the new super geological force on the planet. And so the discussions are, when does the Anthropocene start? And there are lots of different possible dates. For me, that's really a sideline, a, a scientific discussion. It's more really about saying to the people, we're in the Anthropocene. We are now it. We are the dominant species on the planet. And I'll just give you a few facts just to back that up, because I think we also have to think beyond climate change. Yeah. Uh, humanity is so persuasive uh, across the whole planet so for example we move more rock soil sediment than the whole of the natural processes put together mm. we actually make 300 million tons of plastic per year that's more than the weight of all the humans on the planet um, and we also do other things so to give you an example that's the most shocking fact for me is that if you take the weight of land mammals and you then partition them out, 30% are humans. Well, there are 7.8 billion of us. Yeah. 67% is our livestock and our pets. That's nuts. Yeah. And just 3% are the wild animals that mm -hmm. you and I sit down on a Sunday night to watch David Attenborough talk about and film. Mm. Just 3%. Mm. So that's how we've changed the face of the planet yeah i remember in um have you read uh, sapiens by harari 
Have you come across that book? I have, yes. Yeah, I, I remember in that, I remember um, him talking about how whether it was we that domesticized the, the livestock or whether it was they who actually sort of domesticized us in a way, because obviously they're the ones who have succeeded, their numbers are nuts. Um, but that, that is a really crazy statistic because it, it, in the book, I think it says something like, when was it? Uh, 50,000 years ago or something? It was like 98, 99% of the, of the mass of, of life forms on earth were wild animals, weren't they? So we've, we've yeah. changed that in how, however many thousands of years in the blink of an oh, eye. Absolutely. So if, if you go back 10,000 years at the end of the last ice age where agriculture is just starting, 99.95% yeah. of the world was wild animals. So yeah. we've, we've completely turned that on our head. Yeah. And the interesting thing about domestication is I'm not convinced that uh, Harari's idea that they domesticated us. If you look at some of the conditions that battery hens, uh, cows true. and pigs yeah. are kept in, yeah, I'm not sure I would have elected for that. I wouldn't have voted for that. <laughs> no, no. It's, I, I guess it's not quite the same sort of domestication, is it? I guess. Um, but but no, it's a good, it's a good point, obviously. Um, and obviously, now that we've got this fantastic new um, Australian trade deal with battery hens and burnt goats' heads and all the rest of it, we'll be slashing our standards here. So we'll have all that fantastic stuff uh, to look forward to, I, I suppose. But anyway, I, 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 I won't I won't draw you on the on the, on the Brexit stuff. No, but the thing is, that is a real issue because literally today, the government has announced that we should eat less meat. And I've been asked to comment on this in the media. And it's like, okay, but actually you need some policies in place exactly. to actually help us do that. Exactly. So firstly, DEFRA needs to support farmers if they're going to move away from livestock to more arable. If they are going to stay with livestock, we need to support them to do it in a much more green, sustainable and better farming methods. So we need that. We need government to say, OK, we're actually going to help people's health by actually either outlawing or actually taxing processed meat. Mm -hmm. So therefore, people can actually have a much healthier diet. So it's no good turning around and going, right, you people, you should be eating more sort of like vegetable based diets when actually many of the people in this country can't even afford basic food, let alone yeah, yeah. all the fancy vegetables that they need mm. to make sure they have enough protein. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's, I think that's the thing for me um, with, with this government is that they, they're they very good at slogans and, and they're very good at rhetoric and, and they have a lot of cut through with, with, with very basic um, repeated slogans, um, but their policies l are literally the opposite of the things they say at times, um, as you just uh, demonstrated. And, and that is, I've got a question on this later, so perhaps we'll come back to that. Um, but just, just to come back to the sort of the, the neoliberalism then. So I, I noticed in the book, obviously, for those who have read the book, they'll, they'll know this. Um, this is not dense analytical um, paragraphs of, of writing here. These are one lines of facts with, with references that, yeah. that you can go and check out. So, um, but, but you do have like sort of half a page on the kind of the neoliberalism period. And, and I, I thought I, I sensed in there that there was a, a bit of a kind of dig um, at that version of capitalism. You sort of, you talk about the, the, the sort of three um, mercantile industrial consumer capitalism. Assu I, I assumed from that, therefore, that, that you you thought the period of austerity under David Cameron and, and the period of the sort of Reaganomics going back to the 1980s, this has been a really pivotal moment in terms of how we've kind of sleepwalked, if that's the right word, um, into, this, into this climate crisis. So I think it's two things. I think we have a social crisis and we have an environmental crisis. And... I think what people don't realize that in the 1970s, there were a group of very influential economists who honestly believed what they were working on. They saw that there had been great improvements around the world, that people were being lifted out of poverty and wealth was increasing. And what they thought was, well, hang on, actually, this is ridiculous. If we take the training wheels off, and we stop all the regulation and the support, and we just let it go, mm -hmm. it's going to do even better. Mm -hmm. What they forgot to do was think back to what happened between the wars. So between the First World and Second World War, what happened was there was no exchange rate mechanism. There was no support. There was no safety net. There was no World Bank. There was no international monetary fund. All of that was set up at the end of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So nations were failing. And then diving into chaos and into war. 
And so that was really clear that the world powers who actually at the end of the Second World War said, well, hang on, we need to regulate this system and make sure the system doesn't topple over or fall over. But yes, yeah, so what we found in the 1980s and then through to today was the training wheels came off, the markets knew best, and this was sort of like how everybody was going to be lifted out of poverty. And actually, it hasn't worked. I mean, what we see is that the rich get richer, mm -hmm. uh, the middle classes do better off, but everybody else in the bottom half is at the same level as they were in the 1970s, or in the bottom 10%, they're actually worse off. Yeah. And I think what is the problem here is there hasn't now been a uh, a rhetoric about the opposition of about why we should need regulation for me there was two crises the first one was the financial crisis obama and gordon brown had the tools to rewrite the whole of e economics okay the bankers had basically failed because they'd overreached themselves and therefore we had to bail them out but they could have restructured the whole system to say right, let's go back to the whole idea of social democracy and actually support. But they didn't because of that panic. Now, the interesting thing is we've also now had the pandemic. And for me, the pandemic has been really interesting because it's shown to people that when the chips are down and you have a global crisis, mm -hmm. the only people that care about you is the government. And some governments care more than others. It's not companies. And actually, most people saw what companies were doing was going, excuse me, sir, could you have a bailout, please? Mm. And again, I think that has really changed people's views of neoliberalism. And I, I know that there's still the rhetoric out there, but the people on the street suddenly realize that actually when the chips are down, whether it happens to be a pandemic, whether it happens to be your own health care, whether it happens to be, say, climate change, it's actually only government that's actually going to support, regulate, incentivize to make sure that you have a functioning economy. Hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I remember um, somebody, some commentator saying that Boris Johnson um, probably envisaged originally, if he'd ever become prime minister, that he would be socially liberal, so left, and economically um, right. But actually, he's turned out to be a prime minister that is socially very liberal and, and right wing at the, at the moment for obviously cultural reasons, um, but has had to be very economically left wing because we've needed a strong central government with lots of support. Um, so it's kind of ironic that he's he's turned out to be probably the the the, the opposite of, of what he maybe uh, thought he would be perhaps as London mayor or something. Um, but I mean, basically, what you just said there is, is we need left, we need left wing policies back, don't we? We, you know, we need um, strong central government with um, who that's prepared to spend, that we need to take some um, control back from the private sector um, and social democracy. And, and um, we need to um, think about the whole community as opposed to our, ourselves and our individual needs. Is that is this is basically just a left wing argument, isn't it? No, not at all. So I, I would argue what you need is good governance. And it doesn't matter if you happen to be in the right, the middle or the left. What good governance is about is thinking through how do you build policies that actually achieve what you want? Mm -hmm. So how do you build policies that incentivize companies to, say, go green, to actually reduce their footprint? How do you support farmers to actually change their practices and actually do things in a different way? And again, the mixture of tools that you have governments never really think through the full gamut okay so there's incentivization so you can provide subsidies you can provide support networks and you can pay people to do things they wouldn't normally do taxation taxation is a brilliant tool because you can dial it up or dial it down you can tax certain things and and not others which then incentivize people without them knowing that they're going that route mm. and then of course there's the regulation and so you can regulate, but you also then, and this is where this government fails, you also have to enforce. So I would say it doesn't matter if you're left, middle, or right. If you put a rule out there and you regulate, you should be enforcing it. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example, building regulations. Building regulations in this country are very good, very sustainable, very green. However, this government or the previous incarnation of this government said that, okay, 
you can pay a private contractor to come in to check your work. That isn't enforcement or checking. That is your mate coming in going, yeah, 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 your house is all built. For, yeah, it might fall down in 10 years' time, but that's fine. Tick, tick, tick. Yeah. And so therefore you lose that. So for me, it isn't about right, center, or left. It is about good governance, knowing how to govern, basically using all the tools you have, whether it's more left wing, more right wing, to actually get the things you want to do. And really interestingly, you may sound this it sounds very strange, one of the things I've learned about designing really good policies is you need lawyers. And I'm thinking about policy lawyers uh, and people like that who really have a way of thinking about how you can frame things in the country's legal framework. And that differs, of course, in different countries. Mm. Good. I'm glad you said that because um, obviously there will be people listening to this uh, at some point, I imagine, who are on the right. And I don't just want everyone to think that I've only invited, you know, people on who are just going <laughs> to parrot some kind of like le left wing uh, uh, manifesto or something. So that's good. That's, that's, uh, and that's um, that, that ties into a question I have later on. So we, we might touch on that again in a bit. Um, yep. But I, I want to move on now to um, so part of the way through the book. I read a really depressing book over Christmas, which was basically the whole thing was about the like sort of worst case scenarios for climate change. And you kind of touch on worst and best case scenarios. So just very quickly, are you able to just spend two or three minutes basically saying what worst case scenario looks like and what best case scenario looks like, and then where our trajectory is at the moment? Okay, so worst case scenario is that we don't actually stop greenhouse gas emissions they go up and we, by the end of the century, hit about four degrees Celsius of global warming. We're already at about 1.1 degrees, so that's quite a long way away. That would mean that we would have huge numbers of droughts, heat waves, we would have wildfires, not just in California and um, Australia, but we would have them in the Amazon. We would have them spreading from the Arctic into Siberia. We would have them in a large range of places. We would increase the number of storms we have. We would increase the flooding. And I think on top of that, one of the biggest crises is then sea level will keep uh, coming up. And even though it's only small, maybe six to nine millimeters per year, and you think, oh, that's not much, Multiply that by 50 and you're starting to get some really big numbers. Mm. So a lot of coastal cities will have to be abandoned. Um, I love the classic cases. The most vulnerable one is Miami. So sea and Miami. So we would mm. lose coastal cities and would have mm. to do managed retreat. Mm. And I think for me, the actual most problematic thing is actually the temperatures and humidity in the tropics and subtropics. So we think about it at the moment. Over half the world's food is produced by small farmers. They own their own land, they produce food for themselves, but they also produce enough to sell at markets. But they work outside. There are more and more days already, and we've calculated them already for the last 10 years, when days are too hot and humid to physiologically work outside. It's just impossible. It's just mm. too hot, too humid. And if you start to multiply those days up, these people can't work outside, they can't work on the land, and that's really going to affect the food supply. And food insecurity then causes huge issues, as we've seen in many places around the world when, say, uh, the Ethiopian drought, uh, the Syrian drought, you know, that then causes a lot of social unrest and problems. Yeah. So yeah. we're looking at a lot of major issues with human health and food and water security into the future yeah so it's basically it, it, it's not far off a kind of a, an apocalyptic scene really absolutely and and it's going to affect everybody i mean you're going to have uh you think you may be safe in the high arctic no that's actually going to warm by eight to 12 degrees because of the amplification effect there uh in this country very tongue-in-cheek, uh, a few years ago, we did a study uh, for a wine company looking at, worst-case scenario, what would happen to wine production. And when you have grapes being grown around Edinburgh, 
you sort of know that the climate has gone seriously, seriously. Yeah, wrong. You know, <laughs> definitely. Pinot yeah. Noir from Edinburgh, and you just yeah. know you that know things are thing. just not good. No, it's yeah, like, no, yeah. oh, and actually, we found that there was places in the Thames Valley where you could grow Malbec, which is ridiculous because that's an incredibly dry, arid uh, uh, sort of grape. So yeah, yeah, yeah not good. No. <laughs> and then, so best case scenario. Best case scenario is that we not only do we keep the temperatures to one and a half degrees, which means there will still be climate effects, but because we've done that, we are going to remove fossil fuels. So the interesting thing is that means in lots of countries, the air pollution will greatly improve. So I'll give you a really uh, tough example. South Korea, brilliant country, technology is fantastic, and they've also said that they're going to go carbon uh, net carbon zero by 2050. Brilliant. But at the moment, all of their electricity is produced by 60 coal fired power stations, and they complain about air pollution all the time. Admittedly, they blame the Chinese, but actually, you know, so this will greatly improve people's health around the world. Mm. We can also see there are going to be lots of other benefits, not just with the uh, health, but if we can raise people out of extreme poverty at the same time as providing with new energy from renewables, we are going to have a very different world. And I think that's what we need to do. And mm -hmm. that's what I tried to do in the book is say, look, if you were going to be born in 2050, what sort of world do you want to be born into? Do you want this climate change nightmare? Or do you want the sort of ecotopia? Actually, we have 10 billion people and we're going to look after all of them. Yeah. And I think yeah. That is the mindset that we have to have because mm. the economists show that um, the cost of actually fixing or dealing with climate change now, so, so much more, 1% of world GDP. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't include perhaps the savings from health uh, care and things like that. that we get, we get a, a rebate potentially as well with all of that. Absolutely. So 1% plus a rebate. Brilliant. Mm. Or 2050. 20% 20 of the yeah. world GDP in 2050, mm. which actually with the compound interest is the same as world GDP today. Right, right. <laughs> which is just ridiculous. Cost. And that's so, and that, yeah. And that, that's okay. just, that's never going to happen. You're not going to have the world giving up that amount of GDP. I mean, yeah, that, that doesn't make sense at all. So basically what you're saying is we have a bit like what the UN have said, we have, we have very, very little time, basically what everyone says. To actually get going, I mean, I, I suppose you'll, you'll you'll tell me that we're already on our way. I've got a question later about what what your thoughts were on the G7 summit and maybe um, the COP26 um, as well later this year. But perhaps we'll come back to that in a bit. So I, I want to move on next to it. So you've got a little bit in there about um, science denial and how we can challenge science denial. This is something that's for me somebody that sort of likes to have a Barney on social media. Um, you know, that's that's, that's my that's my um, my thing really. Um, I sometimes feel as though I don't necessarily have the tools available to me to, to know how to succinctly take apart what I, what's clearly a rubbish argument. Yeah. Um, but I, I just, I just, you know, either I haven't got, you know, the, the facts in front of me or, or I just feel like oh, it would take too long to actually explain all of this. So you I think you've done a really good job just succinctly saying mm -hmm. this is wrong. And this is the reason why in the book. So I've got a, a few things here. I wondered if you could just give me the rebuttal and I'll just play devil's advocate. So I'm going to say to you, okay, a bit like what Donald Trump did. Well, it's snowing in New York or it's snowing in Texas. Therefore, um, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a little bit more uh, global warming this week? Um, so the answer to that is, weather is always going to be cold in winter and it's always going to be warm in summer just because you have snow in winter doesn't mean global warming isn't happening and i think what you have to think about is how the change of that weather and so you can find so for example the united kingdom we know that the winters are now warmer and wetter and we know that the summers are much drier and hotter however we also know that the winters are becoming more variable. So, for example, the sea ice has retreated uh, beyond uh, Norway, which means every so often we get this blast from the east, the beast from the east, and you get this mm. snow. And you get two or three days of incredibly cold conditions, lots and lots of snow, and then it all melts. Mm. And everybody goes, that was a cold winter. No. For the three months, it was warm and wet, and you just had one cold period. 
So I, I think it's unpacking that and mm-hmm. saying, look at the change on average. And people around the world are seeing this for themselves. This is why I think we've turned a corner against the deniers. Because, for example, if you live in Japan, the cherry blossom's coming 21 days earlier than it did 100 years ago. Mm. If you're in the UK, 12 to 14 days early, the actual plants are flowering. The, uh, the grapes are starting to uh, come much earlier in uh, France. And so we're all seeing in our own eyes that the seasons are shifting mm. and we, know, we also now know why. So I think mm. that that's also a very powerful sort of like message. And I've done that with deniers gone, well, hang on, the British people have collected all of this data that says actually flowers are, and butterflies and things are coming 12 or 14 days before. Are you saying the British public are wrong? <laughs> Which is a brilliant argument because they, they can't, I alienate the public. You know. No, no. Well, yeah, obviously, because it's um, it's the kind of mob uh, mentality of 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 the deniers that I always find um, is, is obviously their often their greatest weapon, isn't it? The kind yeah. of um, will of the people sort of argument. So no, it's a good one. Um, so the next one is climate change is part of the natural cycle. There's always been climate change that always will be, and we'll always we'll always find a, a, a re-equilibrium at some point. So what's what's your problem? Uh, so that's a very easy one to show that actually, yes, there have been cycles, there have been big ice ages, but these take thousands to tens of thousands of years to change the climate. It means that animals and plants can migrate and move with those huge changes, whereas we are changing the climate on a scale and rapidity that's never been seen before. So we have changed the climate in a 100 years by one degree. Yeah. So yes, it does matter. And it also, you turn around and you say, it matters because it's affecting us. We're basically, we have this beautiful house and we're basically kicking it around and going, yeah, yeah, we can do anything we like. We can trash this house. And then looking around and going, oh, <laughs> we've damaged our home. Why are we doing this? So I, I think there's that argument, which is, well, hang on. We really have to worry about how climate change is going to affect people. And the thing is, yeah, if you happen to be up the top of a mountain in your billionaire's estate, yeah, with air conditioning and flood defences, you'll be fine. Jeff Bezos is is fine, basically. Yeah, yeah. And and certain people are going to go off to Mars because they've given up. So it's the rest of us. It's normal. And again, at the end of the day, it's about normal people all around the world having their lives disrupted because we can't deal with a simple pollution issue. Mm. And, and I think for me, the shocking thing is the alternatives are actually better. Electric cars, mm. no air pollution. Mm. You know, and actually, if you happen to be a bit of a petrol head, they accelerate really, really well. You know, that, that's it, so It's very much problems. a case of win-win then, isn't it? Let's, it yeah. Because the solutions Absolutely. not just solve the problem, but they improve what we have already that they improve on the present so it, I'm, yeah that's a nice way of putting it i'll give you one more i've got, I've got quite a few written down here but i'll give you one more um the we don't need to worry too much because at some point like we've always done technology will come to our rescue so we can just sit sloth like and we can just wait for the technocrats and silicon valley to sort it all out for us so this is an interesting one because this sort of technology argument is both on the denier side but it's also on the climate change positive side. Mm. So um, many of you may have read Bill Gates' book. Now, it's very clever and very good and has lots of really good facts in it. And I like the way he splits up the challenge into five major uh, areas. But he is of that idea, which is this is a challenge and therefore we can just solve it with technology. Mm. So let's go back to basics. By 2050, we will have a stable global population of 10 billion people. They all would like to have the lifestyle that we have in Europe. If you think about the consumption, the amount of greenhouse gases, that if we continue on the same uh, route that we have now, it would basically consume three or four Earths. At the moment, we're consuming 1.7 Earths. Mm. So that is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Can we make 10 billion people have really good lives with health care, with water, food, shelter, education, 
Absolutely. Do we have to destroy the earth to do it? No. And so I think that's where you come in. It's a it's a different way of looking at the future. It yeah. isn't about this small elite group who are we're okay, we'll just suck CO two out of the atmosphere. It's like yeah. yeah. But what about all the other issues? You know, what about all the deforestation? What about all of the actual destruction of the exactly, natural landscape? Yeah. And again, we've already seen that when we impinge upon nature too much and we don't respect it, zoonotic diseases like the pandemic basically jump from wild animals into humans and we're paying the consequences. Exactly, yeah. Um, and I, I, in the afterthoughts, I think, in your book, you obviously you talk about COVID and how um, the the deforestation is obviously leading to animals mixing where they perhaps wouldn't done. And then obviously we're getting um, these pandemics, um, which is, you know, I think that's been um, communicated a fair bit actually since, since COVID. So hopefully that that's another argument in our kind of arsenal that, that will help us a little bit. Um, good. I think that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's really good. So basically we don't need the Avengers. We don't need, um, you know, Iron Man. We need, <laughs> we need people power. We need a, a political, and an economic rethink, um, and then people power to back it up. Obviously, top down and bottom up, um, yeah. as, you know, as opposed to just being like, yeah, where's the Hulk? Hulk? You know, um, so good. So the next question I have, this is from your chapter six, um, power of the individual. This this brings us on quite nicely. Is so just talk to me about what the power of the individual is, because what I said to my partner before this, I said, look, I'm interviewing Mark in a minute. I said, you know, you're not really that in, in, involved in this. Just give me the kind of punters. First question that comes to your head, like what, what, what's a good question to ask? And um, she said, um, okay, well, she's kind of gone flexitarian and she's like, well, I mean, I, you know, I'm just one person doing my, doing my own thing. I just feel like I'm not having an impact. And I said, well, it's, it's about, clearly it's about all of us having that mentality of hopefully my little thing will add up like a raindrop in an ocean or something. Um, so tell me about people power and tell me why the individual doing something really small still matters. Okay, so there, there were two really good arguments one which is in the book and one that's come out of the book. So the first thing is that as individuals, we have the ability to affect ourselves and our community. And for me, so this is why in the book, I, the first thing I say is talk about it. The fantastic thing is you and your partner are talking about climate change and what are you going to do? I think we've basically been in self-denial for too long. We, we refuse to talk about it. I mean, as I say, I'm amazed that we will discuss whether the prime minister should or should not have John Lewis furniture in his flat and yeah. who the hell should pay for it. Yeah. But the greatest threat facing humanity will just go, shh, let's not talk about that. You know, sort of like it's, 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 it's something we shouldn't really be worried about, you know, mm. just let's not. So I think talking about it is really important. But there are lots of little things you can do because we are all individuals and we are all consumers. So going flexitarian, absolutely brilliant because it's win-win. It's good for the environment, but it's also good for your health. The more you can go towards the vegetarian route, the better for your health, better for the planet. And if you tip into veganism, maybe say a couple of days a week, absolutely brilliant. Again, simple things like switching your energy to renewables. I love the fact that in Finland, they've said, hmm, we've read the psychologists. We're going to put everybody on a green tariff, but you have the right to opt out. And so the interesting thing is people are very busy. They have busy, busy, complicated lives. So the idea of being able to switch uh, energy producer or change tariffs really is a bit of an effort. But if mm. you put everybody on one, then some people, of course, some people will switch going, oh, I can save a few pennies here by going on to a fossil fuel tariff, you know, but most people won't. So mm. I think we can also help people. So there's lots of really positive things like actually taking more exercise, using your car less. Can you swap your car, get ahead of the curve to basically mean you have the electricity uh, uh, junctions already for your electric car? You know, there are lots of things. And one of the really big things that people forget about is your pension. Mm. Now, if you can turn around to your pension firm and lobby them and say, I'm really sorry, I don't want you to invest in fossil fuels. That's really bad. And then, of course, if you happen to be lucky enough to have investments, yeah, I wish, uh, then, of course, 
Oh, yeah. You can invest in, and we know that actually green economy provides two or three times the actual return on your money than, say, fossil fuels. So there's lots of really simple things, mm. but that's in the book. One yeah. of the other things I've realized is, and this is by talking to lots of people and realizing that we have what I will call green sustainable viruses, and individuals are incredibly powerful at doing this. So people are just passionate. And I found that in companies, organizations, um, that suddenly somebody will go, oh, we perhaps we should do something a bit more sustainable. And they start to agitate. And that infects the people around them. And suddenly I've seen a whole company, a billion dollar company, suddenly all be infected all the way up to the CEO. Mm. And this was a company that went from uh, not knowing what sustainability to winning prizes at the Carbon Disclosure Project. You know, yes, so... Yes. And that happens. So, and and it's really weird. It's happening everywhere. So that's uh, mimetic theory, isn't it? That's this, uh, an, an idea takes hold and it just spreads like wildfire, and all of a absolutely. sudden it changes. Yeah. But it takes an individual, mm. and I think this is what people think. Uh, I don't think that they should think that individuals aren't powerful. One mm. individual, without realizing it, can affect a whole organization yeah. and actually produce change. And I say to people, it can take time. Okay, mm. so. I and many of my colleagues at University College London have been agitating for over 15 years. Right. And nothing seemed to be changing. Nothing seemed... Then a couple of years ago, suddenly things seemed to change at a really fast rate. And last year, UCL announced that all buildings will be carbon neutral by 2024 and the university will be net carbon zero by 2030. And I'm going... Whoa, where did that come from? But yeah. that was 15 years of gently agitating. I'm yeah. hoping other places will be quicker. Mm. Mm. Good. Um, that's, that's, yeah, I think that's a really comprehensive answer on that. Um, so uh, you said in here, obviously, talking is really important. Talking to your partner, talking to whoever it is, your work colleagues, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you mentioned this in the book. And I remember when I was reading, I annotated the book for the first time. And I just put how next to it. Because I feel like there's still a lot of people who I talk to who either find it too depressing to want to talk about mm -hmm. that they either dig in or they become a bit denialist um or it's, it's not it's because you don't want to become you don't want to be seen as preachy either so like I, I i never mentioned the fact that i'm a vegetarian or but people will ask me oh james you're a vegetarian i didn't know that oh how come and I, and I always give the kind of the same stock answer which is i love meat don't get me wrong it wasn't really the ethical side of things it, it was it was just that i'm i, I am so terrified of the idea of, of the climate emergency and i wanted mm -hmm. to just do something and I, I knew that i wouldn't have it in me to give up flying because i am a yeah. keen traveler um yeah. and i just needed something to be like okay at least i'm doing something um so how do you talk to people without being preachy or without depressing the life out of them have you found a strategy for just conversing with the average man on the street who like my dad is a, is a good example of this as somebody who was very like, no, I'm not giving up meat. I love you to death, son. I'll take mm -hmm. a bullet for you. Would you, dad? That's great. Would you maybe change your diet for one day of the week just so that we don't die in the future? <laughs> no, no chance. I'll take a bullet. I'm not, I'm not giving up meat for a day. <laughs> All right. Thanks, dad. But I say like people like my dad, maybe of a, of a slightly older generation. How, how do you talk to people about the climate emergency and actually without depressing or aggravating or, or alienating them? I mean, I think it's about the win-win solution. So for example, when you were talking about being vegetarian, um, depending on which mates you were with, mm. I would have probably uh, cheated and led off with, yeah, well, I'm doing it for my health because, you know, I, I, I want to be able to sort of like keep fit, you know, and sort of like I'm really worried about my health. And also what's really great is also it supports the planet and, you know, it's really good. And uh, and also, and then the next one, I worry about the welfare of the animals. Et okay. So just so, re reorder my reason. Absolutely. And, yeah, okay. and you, 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 the people you're talking to. So when I give these sort of like interviews or talks, I'm always talking to the uh, Pacific audience. So I'm always mm. trying to engage with them and find what actually matters to them. And I think one of the key things that links everybody is actually our health. Okay. And I think so. I actually, when I, if I was talking to your father, I'd sit down and go, look, dad, love you to death. Want you around as long as possible. Could you please just cut down your meat? Okay. Because look, Here's all the stats about heart attacks. Da, 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 da. I wouldn't go down the environmental route. I'd just go down the selfish. 
look, <laughs> you need to look after yourself. Okay. And yeah. I think also, I think your partner has the right view. You don't have to completely give up meat. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that people, uh, I, I get the feeling there's that guilt stress. Mm-hmm. If your father went flexitarian and you said, look, dad, every day of the week, except Sunday, where, like when we were kids, you have your meat. But when you do, oh, have the best meat. Have a Wagyu burger. Have something top end so you actually enjoy it. It's not this crap meat that you eat all the time. Just have, and you just go, oh, that's like a fine Chianti or something like that. And I think mm. that's how we need to change people's relationship with food, which mm. is look, have great food, have really healthy vegetarian, but every so often, if you need that sort of like, a uh, piece of meat, et cetera, have the best you can. And I think that's the way we can we can move through this. And then people will find that they have less and less meat in their diet. Yeah. For me, again, the biggest evil is the processed meat with all the sugars and all the salts and all the preservatives and all the E uh, numbers yeah. that we find in cheap food. And I think that's a real issue we have about poverty in this country. And so people don't have the choice to actually eat healthily. I mean, I remember a Scottish comedian talking about trying to discuss with his father. Now he was middle class and his father was still working class. Why he spent one pound fifty on an avocado. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, it's like Kevin Bridges. Why? Exactly. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, and, and it's a brilliant sketch, but it yeah. sums up everything that is wrong with how food and again different countries we go to different countries you're you're a world traveler you go to different countries and people's relationship with food is very different yeah it's yeah. actually part of the culture and it's about actually producing sort of like food as a family and things like that and i mm. think we've lost that uh in this country in many ways and it'd be nice to try and get some of that back yeah no, totally agree. I think that's a good. That's a really good answer, actually. So basically, a bespoke answer depending on the person you're you're potentially um, dealing with, um, but communi- uh, communi- communicate it in a way that, that that's emotive and and um, doesn't put too much pressure on them. For example, if I'm talking to a CEO that I know is a hard nosed business person, whether it's a he or she, they are just there to make money. Absolutely fine. I'll turn around to them and go, okay, but you really need a sustainable company. No, I don't. Uh, yes, you do, because you want to actually uh, have some really good young talent coming in. Yeah. Well, look at the actual stats. They're not going to work for you unless you happen to have a sustainability policy. You That's happen true. to be ethical. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, you're losing out to your competitors for that. Mm. So That's the first thing. Second thing I go, well, hang on. Look at your competitors. Are they doing it? Oh, yes, they are. Therefore, shouldn't you be trying to keep up with them or are you just going to lose out? because they must know something you don't. And then the third one, which is, look, I can show you the stats for why green companies, ones that actually understand their carbon footprint, actually make more money. And so there are all these arguments. And the thing is, it's because, and I I call them honest deniers. Okay, Mm. These are people that don't have the facts. They don't have time to look them out. Mm -hmm. But when you actually say to them, look, these are all the facts actually if you do this 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 it's going to be better for your company Mm. and it's going to be better for your bottom line and you're going to be able to employ much better young dynamic talent they go no brainer yeah so i yes tailor your message and chat to who you're talking to yeah good um i've got a question next about the the g7 summit what did you make of it uh first of all did you did you think anything Positive came out of it. There, there were a few uh, new commitments. Um, obviously, a lot of talk in the media afterwards about about these things. But I always get the impression with this government that, that they they excel at talking and, and and not much else. But I mean, are, are you hopeful after the G seven summit? So I'm hopeful because of the way the global politics has changed for climate change, and I think the interesting thing is we are now got a set of world powers that are aligned, which hasn't happened over the last four or five years. Mm. So you've got Britain, who, despite this government, actually has a legal a legal target of reducing our carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. Yeah. That the Climate Change Act is a brilliant piece of legislation. And we also have five-year budgets, so we even know how we're going to get there. By 20, 
2030, we're supposed to have dropped it by 78% on 1990 levels already. So that's a very dynamic. The EU are doing the same. They've got their interim targets and they've got a net zero target for 2050. America, boom, you know, second largest uh, uh, sort of economy in the world has stepped in and said, we're doing the same. Thanks to the election of Joe Biden. Absolutely. And yeah. again, change that politics. But yeah. what will be interesting is all the things that he will be doing will be hard baked into their system. Yeah. And the thing is, it's interesting because once you start the ball rolling, then actually it's really difficult to unpick it. Mm. And then we look at China. China has announced last year uh, at the UN and they said, we are going to peak our emissions by 2030, but then we will hit net zero by 2060. Hmm. Now, that's nowhere near enough. So no. I'm part of the Sir David King uh, Climate Crisis Advisory Group. And today we were online and actually the call from us is to say, actually, we need to reduce our emissions by 50% as soon as possible. And actually, we should have a net zero target by 2035 or 2040 at the latest. So we we think that even 2050 is too far ahead. Yeah. But it's progress. And that's more progress, I think, in the last year, despite having a pandemic, than we've had in about the last 25 years. So lots of hopeful things. However, everything's not going to be solved at COP26 in Glasgow. Okay, mm. these are just these sort of razzmatazz and the great announcements and the all the leaders of the world want to look good. Yeah, what we need at Glasgow is some solidarity. We need to get those 192 countries to actually pull together and realize that the world economy is going this way, and actually, everybody else is going this way. So, if you don't follow, you're going to be left behind and your economy is going to suffer. And then that move to being net zero is actually something that becomes hard baked into everybody's economy. Yeah. So really, COP26 will come out with some hopefully a really uh, brilliant agreement, but those agreements are only as good as the national laws that are put in yeah. when the delegates get home. So they can all go, yes, absolutely. And we've seen this with American presidents. So American presidents have previously made pledges and said, yes, absolutely, we support this knowing that when they go back, the House of Representatives or the Senate won't support it. Yeah. What's really interesting now is Biden can actually agree anything he likes at COP26 because he has control of both houses. So as long as he does it quickly <laughs> and gets stuff through, yeah. then there'll be stuff on the legislative books. Yeah, and, and you would assume there might be a few rebellious uh, members of the Republican Party who might be prepared to... Um, to vote with the, the Democrats on on some stuff in the Senate, where they where where they might need the the, the extra vote pop, uh, from time to time. But do they have do they have complete control of the Senate? I thought it was, I thought it was fifty fifty. Yeah. So no, but they have uh, the um, uh, vice president has the uh, vote casting vote. Oh, okay, deciding vote. I didn't didn't know that actually. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's so, very yeah, exciting. So the, the, yeah. So so that things can get. I mean, it does mean that you get. Uh, your prisoner to your own party. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so one person go. Well, I really need something in Dakota. You know, uh, sorry, Dakota. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there's still politics, but it, it's a different uh, rhetoric. It's a different way of yeah. actually approaching it. So, and the thing is, and I say this, I've never understood why the Republican Party hasn't picked up on climate change. I mean, for me. If I was, if I'd been Trump, I would have embraced climate change. I would have said, yes, right. The first thing we need to do is to build high speed train networks all up the, uh, the east and west coast, uh, have some hubs going to Chicago and to Atlanta. Yeah. And we would do this. We will use American steel, American workers, American technology, mm -hmm. and we'll make sure that they're bullet trains traveling at 300 miles per hour, yeah. and our technology will sell around. It's the world. a good point because it, it, the, if you're a nativist and you and you're all about, you know, the the left behinds, um, there can be a green industrial revolution, which loads of investment, loads of jobs, lo you know, all these um, left behind areas, which were former, um, you know, blue collar. 
places of industry, you can you could you could definitely make that argument. I guess the answer is, um, and I, I, I watched your video with um, uh, the the former vice president. I've literally got a mind blank on his name. Al Gore. Al Gore. Yeah. <laughs> Um, who, who obviously in his answer gave a fairly comprehensive answer about the problem with how, I mean, basically they are the party of, of billionaires now, aren't they? The, the Republicans and the Conservatives are going that way as well. They do the bidding of fossil fuel um, and all the politicians are in, in the pockets of the fossil fuel with the Tea Party um, um, and, and the alt-right um, obviously coming up with a lot of dirty money as backing. Um, I guess that's hard to, to give that up, isn't it? I mean, I have to say that was what was really interesting about interviewing Al Gore because, hey, look, I'm a climatologist. I wasn't going to ask him about climate change. But what I was really interested in his latest film was he was he started to talk about actually the need to fix democracy before mm. fixing the climate change. No, totally, uh, totally, yeah. And again, he was really clear that this bipartisanship, um, and we have this issue in this country because we have fast first past the post politics yeah. Yeah. it means that people aren't represented in parliament mm -hmm. so at the moment we have a parliament that has an 80 person majority but probably only 40 percent of the population voted for the government yeah i think and it that just isn't... under 50 yeah but yeah yeah, yeah you're right yeah. and it doesn't represent what the population think and feel and i think mm -hmm. that representative democracy is missing from certain countries. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what um, Al Gore was talking about, which was there are solutions to climate change on the right and the left. And you have to remember, in America, it really isn't left. It is right, right, and right. <laughs> okay, so, you know, yeah. and, and I think there what he was trying to say is like denying the science because you don't want to do stuff seems to be rather strange because actually you have the solutions on the right wing. If you want to actually uh, incentivize companies to change things, you can, you know, and there are lots of ways that uh, right wing governments can uh, be actually quite dictatorial in actually changing how uh, certain companies or people actually behave. And therefore you can still use that. And again, in the book, one of the things I say is, the atmosphere does not care what color political badge you wear. Mm. All it cares about is how much greenhouse gases are going in the atmosphere. So personally, I don't really care what politics you use or what policies you use, unless they're not really repressive, um, to actually change uh, industry and change the way we're doing stuff. Mm. Good. Um, I think I think you're you're absolutely right to make that point as well because like like I said earlier, um, I, I often find that you know because the green the Green Party is a socialist party um, you know in its values, um, the Labour Party again is a socialist party. I think a lot of people equate kind of climate action with the left or sometimes the hard left, um, but it's it's actually something that affects it doesn't it should transcend politics really. It's, it should be an apolitical. Um, fight for the hot the thing really it should be the first thing that's ever united our, our entire species you know i always i always thought it would be like an alien invasion but clearly it's going to be climate <laughs> change um but um so i have a i have a sort of two final questions so the first question is how effective are groups like extinction rebellion because for me i joined extinction rebellion i didn't get involved in the kind of the the, the breaking of the law and stuff because as a school teacher i need my um my criminal record clean sort of thing um but I, I definitely support them because I felt they were they were one of the only groups that, that that for me in terms of the tone and the urgency that they were they they were doing something different and I felt that because I, I was having a bit of a crisis myself about the lack of urgency that they were they were the ones actually on the ground being a bit naughty and actually getting stuff done um, but I, I I'm also conflicted about Extinction Rebellion because I know a lot of people who I know would be would be sympathetic to the aims, but are alienated by the action. So I don't want to draw you too much on whether you know, you're know you pro or anti extinction rebellion, but do you find that there are enough groups who are actually effective at getting the message across? And do, do you think extinction rebellion's methods are uh, a good way of doing it? Um, so for me, what was really interesting is the effect that different groups have had. So extinction rebellion, 
absolutely brilliant. So what they had done is direct action, actually highlighting an issue and making it in the consciousness. And I think that's really important because you have to raise awareness. Mm -hmm. And even if you do it in a radical way, that's mm -hmm. still good. However, I also think what was incredibly powerful, particularly for politicians, was the school strikes. So yeah. on one hand, you've got this incredibly diverse group, which is Extinction Rebellion, which goes from teenagers up to 70-year-olds basically gluing themselves to train. But also very left-wing. Uh, in, in many ways, yes. Uh, you, you don't see many Tories basically sticking themselves to trains, I have to admit. you know. Um, so th there is that. But on the other side, you then had school children all around the world saying, I'm really sorry, this is a major issue. Why aren't you dealing with it? I mm -hmm. mean, by the end, before the pandemic, there were 5 million young people who basically were going on strike. And it's really yeah. interesting. So I was dragged on to one of these by my daughters and um, they basically took me on. And it wasn't like, and I have to say this, it was not like the marches of my youth, okay? Whereas if a brick hadn't been thrown somewhere at some time in the first five minutes, it wasn't a proper march. <laughs> these were like festivals. They are like festivals. It's yeah. like yeah. really upbeat. They're really optimistic because they, they sort of realize that if we don't fix it, they will. And I think yeah. that powerful youth message mm. scared a lot of politicians to say, well, hang on. They're, they're going to be looking at our legacy and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason we're in this trouble is because of this, 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 this politician. You know, and people want to have a legacy. So I think that was very powerful because they are going to be voters. They're also the consumer group that every company desires and wants to get to because yeah. they are going to be in five to ten years the major uh, earners, etc. Mm. And so I think the two were incredibly complementary. Mm. You then, of course, have all these powerful reports that were coming out from the scientists. So these IPC reports about one and a half degrees, absolutely brilliant, perfectly timed to come out at the same time. And then on top of that, we've had a proper shift in the media. So you mentioned the David Attenborough uh, Climate Change the Facts program which was important because it was the first time in 10 years that BBC One dared to tackle climate change. Mm. And they got such that. a positive, such a positive reaction yeah. that they went, oh, we can do this now. You know, it's, we're not going to be lambasted by sort of like uh, deniers left, right and centre. Mm. And so we've had uh, the incredible series with Greta Thunberg. Uh, we've had aid actually uh, sort of going around the world looking at how climate change is affecting people. Absolutely brilliant. So we're suddenly getting all of this. And you see now in the news, it's just there is no if there is climate change. It's like this is happening. This is climate change. We yeah. need to deal with it. Yeah. And I think all of those together have changed people's views. Yeah. But for me, I think the most exciting thing and the weirdest thing is in the middle of a pandemic, a global pandemic, where you think that we'd all be focused on this horrible virus and how do we deal with it and how do we get out of it, that everything else would disappear. When we had the financial crash, all discussion of climate change disappeared. Mm. Pandemic's different. Everybody is now talking about climate change yeah, build back and the pandemic. It's the slogan. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's one of those things whereby it's really realized that the pandemic is a mini version of what climate change is going to do. Mm. And I love the fact that we talk about flattening the curve for climate change. And of course, that's exactly what we were trying to do with the pandemic was yeah. flatten the curve, keep yeah. just flatten the curve as much yeah. as possible. Yeah. And, that, and obviously the climate change curve is, is the one that, that, that has got the potential to be orders of magnitude greater in terms of effect than, than, um, than the COVID one. Um, so that's that's the curve we really do need to flatten. I've seen some good XR yeah. graphics showing flatten this curve and obviously the um, yeah. the carbon emissions and stuff. Good. I'm, I'm, so you're so you're definitely sort of in the kind of XR or, a, or an aggregate good kind of camp. Absolutely. You yeah. have to have agitators. You have to have people that protest. You have to have people that push the envelope to remind democratically elected leaders that they are accountable to the people. Yeah. And I also think that there are lots of different ways of actually protesting. And I think that 
the mixture of the radical and just striking. Yeah. <laughs> just well, absolutely different. And the thing is, I, I love the fact that the policemen who were on the London March were just going, this is great. You know, I, I could do a climate march every day of the week. This is brilliant. This is fantastic. This is what marches should be like. So mm. I think... But of course, the, the policing bill, that, Priti Patel's policing bill that's coming in has basically been designed to, to take down Extinction Rebellion, hasn't it, pretty much? Um, I think it's been designed to stop people protesting about anything that mm. the government wants to do. Mm. And this is an issue where you have governments, particularly on the extreme right or the extreme left, mm. who worry about their policies yeah. because they know that they're not popular. They're just what they want to do. Mm. And again, you see this crackdown in Poland, in Hungary, in other countries, China. Yeah. Yeah. You have these crackdowns all the time when the government doesn't feel that the people are behind them, you know. Mm. And there's only so much that they can get away with before the people do actually go, hang on, yet yeah, no, not at all. Yeah. Um, however, go back through the politics of this country, you will see that we have a very healthy record of protesting uh, in many, many different ways against policies that we do not agree with. Mm. Not always successful, but again, that's part of being in a democracy where we can actually uh, voice. And I think that even if the police bill gets through, we will still find ways of protesting and getting around it. Yeah. I mean, I used to teach in a primary school and we, we, we used to teach about the suffragettes and they're, they're taught these days through the lens of kind of these are these were heroes, really. Um, and it may be in 50, 50 years time that we look back at, um, you know, the climate rebels and, and we look at them and say these 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 guys were were um, were, were heroes back then. Um, who knows? Um, certainly, if, if Theresa May has it her way, I remember when she was slating the, the the youngsters on the youth marches, saying they need to get back to school and all of that. I thought that was a really disappointing because she was a prime minister at the time. I thought that was really disappointing. But anyway, so the final question I have is, I mean, this is something that I talk about a lot. Is is my constant concern is, will this help the kind of the, the rise of the sort of populist right? And so in the book, you talk about, obviously, best case scenario, lots of changes very quickly. Surely the pace matters here, because if things change too quickly, we saw with the yellow vests in France when they were protesting, obviously, what I guess Macron was trying to do, which was a progressive um, thing to do with climate change. It backfired and he had to U-turn um, pretty quickly to save his presidency. Um, so how, how can we reach these targets without the the right without it being exploited by people like Nigel Farage and the far right. So I think the key thing to do with climate change uh, is actually to build on the win-win solutions. I mean, I was on uh, BBC London Radio talking about sort of like uh, electric vehicles, and of course, there's this whole no, why should we have electric vehicles? You know, petrol ones are just as good. And I turned around and said, well, hang on, why, why are we having all this air pollution? Why do we have diesel vehicles and uh, cars, etc.? If we all switch to electric vehicles, we would half the air pollution in our cities. And that would mean that all our kids that have asthma would be able to breathe much more healthily. And we wouldn't have so many of them dying from this sort of uh, air pollution. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think this is where we need to push back, which is to say, hang on. The things that we are going to do to save our planet are also saving ourselves and actually either making our little bit of uh, um, sort of uh, uh, London or wherever we live healthier, safer, nicer. And also we can also boost the economy by driving innovation and entrepreneurship. So, mm. I mean, for me, it's turning around to people going, why wouldn't you? Yeah, it's like once. If I was in government and I would uh, put proper subsidies in to make sure that electric cars were always cheaper than the petrol equivalent, I would go, why wouldn't you? You know, it's it's again, people, we had this question to, uh, earlier today, which is people don't like change. Okay, I don't, you don't. Nope. Okay, <laughs> when there's a new operating system on my computer, I'm going, I hate you. Yeah, yeah. same. But of course, we are incredibly adaptable. 
Mm. So when seat belts were brought in, this was going to be the end of sort of like driving. No, decimalization. Oh, we'll never be able to get used to it. Yeah, mm. next day it's fine. Yeah, just congestion zone charge. Oh my word! I remember in the newspapers there was somebody quoting, and I won't say who it was, who said, "This is the end of Western civilization." <laughs> next day, and next day, Londoners just went, "Yeah, okay, I don't drive, or I pay the congestion zone charge." So again. And the pandemic shows this. Yeah. Humans are incredibly flexible and adaptable. When things hit the fan, we can change and adapt our lives, okay? Yeah. Wearing masks, washing hands, not talking to people, not having to hug. You know, we change because it was necessary. Now, yeah. I'm not saying that it's going to be all bad change. I think a lot of things that are going to change. For example, houses. Heat exchangers, people going, oh, my word, why are we going to change it? Because they heat and cool your house. Climate change will mean that we're going to have a lot hotter summers. We're going to have heat waves like 2003. So by the government mandating that you've got to have heat exchangers, oh, which will happen to cool your house as well as heat them, that's a good thing. So uh, there's, everything's a win-win. Yeah. And it's not just me spinning it, honestly. Yeah, I yeah. mean... If you look at how people are looking at different things, they're all win, win, and sometimes win solutions. Yeah. I think that's how we need to talk about it and push back against the far right and the far left and yeah. say, no, I'm sorry, we don't accept your extreme views. We just want better, better, and better. I have I just I have a quick rebuttal on that because so it sounds like you've got the solutions, you've got the arguments, you know, you've got all the win-win and the rhetoric there, and it's all very persuasive. The, the issue that I have when I observe the kind of the media landscape is that you have a lot of the big papers at, who target, um, you know, the communities that we really need to target is sort of the people that aren't sold on this yet are sort of cynical right, right wing outlets. If you think you know, the Mail, the Sun, the Telegraph, the Express, the Spectator, mm -hmm. you've got GB News now, you've got all the alt right um, monster pages on, on social media that still haven't been taken down, maybe some. Um, that should be like leave.eu, I think is a fascistic outlet, but that's a different matter. Um, very powerful means of communication. And they are a complete gateway with the door closed to actually convincing the sorts of people that we need to convince. So it's all very well, you know, you're going on BBC um, radio and you're doing the, the brilliant stuff on um, BBC iPlayer. How, how do we get your message across if a huge part of the media landscape is basically a, a complete closed door to what it is that you want to say? So for me, I think that people pay too much attention to what we call mainstream um, media. And this is not to take anything away from the newspapers or TV, but actually, and I think Al Gore picked up on this uh, uh, when I was interviewing him. He basically said, actually, the way people communicate now is actually not through the classical roots. So if you talk to the young people on the climate marches, they're not reading the Daily Mail. They're not reading the Daily uh, Telegraph. They're, they're not even watching the BBC News. They're getting it through their influencers. They're getting it through their social media channels. They're getting mm. it in a different landscape. So I think what we need to do is, one, understand that there is a much wider uh, media uh, outlets that we need to engage in and actually mm. engage in very positively. And... The other interesting thing about sort of like the uh, what you might call the right wing media is many of them have now moved beyond the denial stage and climate change is uh, um, happening. Therefore, and what they're arguing about is how you deal with it. And of course, they want much more right wing policies as opposed to left wing policies, which I think is interesting. One of the things you didn't mention, and I will tell you. And I will predict this in the next 12 months or so will become a new rhetoric, which is we do not have the money to deal with climate change at this moment in time. Yeah. We're still dealing with the problems of COVID. We don't have money to fix it. And this rhetoric has been going on for the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, there isn't a magic and money tree. Absolutely. But the thing is, think about it. 26 billionaires own the same wealth as the bottom 3.9 billion people. Britain is the fifth 
richest country in the world? How comes we have food banks and why are they expanding? It is again this rhetoric about there isn't money. No, there is money, but it's about how you distribute it within countries and between countries. Yeah. And I think that is something we really have to push it back against and say there's always money. There's always money out there. It's what you decide to do with it. Yeah, and if you totally. want it to go to a smaller and smaller part of the population, then that is your choice, but you have to be upfront about it and we have to expose that. Yeah, and again, totally. um, just because you happen to be a right-wing government and you support entrepreneurship, you support individuals and you support companies and basically doing it for yourself, that doesn't mean that you want to actually neglect most of your population who are going to generate all your ideas and all your entrepreneurship to put money into a very small bit. So I actually sometimes have a real issue with people that say they are right wing because they're not. So, for example, most right wing governments are still supportive of fossil fuel subsidies. Why? If you believe the market knows best, remove all the subsidies. OK, let them fight it out. And strangely enough, renewables are already cheaper and therefore the system will change automatically. Mm -hmm. So I get this. I do not like the fact that you have on the right and also the left people that are not sticking to their core values. It's mm. like, I'm sorry, you cannot have your cake and eat it. You cannot say well, we believe the market's no we best, we but we're going to, it, but... and we're going to subsidize X, Y, and Z because yeah. Yeah. They're, they're more important. Uh, so I just want to say thank you so much for um, taking the time to have this Q&A with us. Um, for those who haven't gone out and read this book yet, it's, it's definitely worth having in, in, your, in your arsenal, in your repertoire. Go out and get it 100%. Um, it's a nice, nice read to give to people, perhaps who, who don't, who aren't on top of the facts as well. Um, and you can read it within, you know, a couple of hours. I read this in the bath, literally in an hour and a half. So um, it was, a, it was a fantastic um, addition to my, to my sort of climate change repertoire. Definitely, Mark. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me on, James. It's been a pleasure.